I was an evolutionist, a godless evolutionist at Princeton University <clears throat> when God saved me by His grace in February 1943, <clears throat> and I have never recovered. What a joy to know that the world has been planned and created and controlled by someone who knows where he's going and is in total charge in spite of our limited observation. You know, it's so sad, friends, to look around and see people who have no hope, no perspective of what God is doing and what he's promised. But one man we're going to look at for a few minutes this morning <clears throat> did have a marvelous perspective on the origin, nature, and destiny of the world into which God placed him at an opportune time of great crisis for Israel. And that man was Daniel. <clears throat> I almost wish we could sing a song, Dare to be a Daniel. And friends, we need people like that today, don't we? And I'm sure Pastor Kotke, your church is full of such people. Praise the Lord. We know Daniel is sort of special to me. <clears throat> uh, he's the only other one in the Bible of whom no evil is spoken, who never apparently, according to the scriptures, made a single misstatement or mistake. Now that doesn't mean he was sinless because he gives an elaborate confession in chapter 9 of the fact that he was a total participant in the sins of Israel and deserved the judgment that he himself was experiencing namely 70 years of captivity in Babylon because of disobedience and disrespect for God on the part of the nation in Jerusalem and even in the temple. The only other one in the Old Testament who is apparently sinless, but obviously wasn't, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God except the Lord Jesus, was Joseph. And isn't it fascinating that both Joseph and Daniel served God <clears throat> under extremely different, difficult circumstances in a foreign court. Joseph where? Egypt. And Daniel where? Babylon. <clears throat> and both of them suffered excruciating agonies of affliction for the glory of their God. Joseph years in a dungeon in Egypt, falsely accused and hated even by his brothers. <clears throat> and Daniel many years, especially after Nebuchadnezzar died, ending up in a lion's den. And that was simply to show the whole world that men under affliction who know the Lord can survive and maintain a clear and wonderful testimony for their Savior. Well, there are just a few things I'd like to share from our studies on the book of Daniel every Tuesday night up there in northeastern Indianapolis. <clears throat> it's so good to see the Pitcocks again. They have been coming, and we hope that for the final three sessions of this course, the second and fourth Tuesdays of next month, May, and also June the 1st, that some of you would like to join them and come and visit our class. We have 35 wonderful students, and we've been studying this book week after week and discovering things at least have been fresh and an encouragement to me personally. Well, what are some things that God would have us learn from Daniel, a man of God? Well, first of all, he was a man of discipline, self-discipline, wasn't he? If you turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Even though now as a teenager... Thank you. He has been wrenched out of his home in Jerusalem and sent off 800 miles away to Babylon with his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You've heard the story. His convictions were very deep, doubtless having been discipled by Jeremiah, maybe Zephaniah and Habakkuk as well, great prophets of God. And he knew the Lord. In fact, in my opinion, he's an exemplification of a proper attitude of a Jew in exile. You don't have to turn, but please listen. This was written by Jews in Babylon who had been taken from their homeland because of the disobedience of their leaders. 
There our captors in Babylon demanded of us songs, and our tormentors demanded mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. We want some entertainment. We've heard of the famous music of the choirs of the temple in Jerusalem. Please start singing for us. We want some entertainment. Now listen to their response. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her skill, that is to play an instrument for singing, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth so that I can't sing, if I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Now, friends, that should be the attitude of every Jew in the world outside of the Holy Land, outside of Jerusalem. My chief joy is Jerusalem. There is the place where God met us, you see, in the person of David and Solomon to build the great temple that was God's foot, foothold, as it were, on planet Earth. And Daniel had a deep respect for God's promises and God's provisions, even in this desperate situation in which he found himself. Now, when he arrived in Babylon, you remember, he was offered the richest provisions of the king in order that he might be healthy and happy while he masterminded Babylonian religion and language and culture so he could be sort of a, a diplomat or an ambassador of Israel in the court of Babylon. But he refused. Verse 8, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. He decided this food is contaminated by having been offered to idols. I want to maintain my devotion to God no matter what the personal price or cost may be. You see, friends, a teenage decision for the Lord helps to determine the whole direction of the life that follows. I was not raised in a Christian home. Perhaps you weren't. But friends, what a, what a marvelous thing it is for a young person, even a preteen, of course, as we've already seen this morning on this uh, platform, to say, Lord, I don't know what's ahead for me. I don't know what your will is for my life. That's in your hands. But whatever I do, I want to do it for your glory and not for my selfish ambition or comfort or happiness. That's the key, isn't it, to the book of Daniel? A man who determined under God, who made up his mind not to defile himself for God's glory. But he also had great respect for the government under which he now was serving. He was not an insurrectionist, a rebel. He didn't show disrespect for the Babylonian government. Absolutely not. He asked permission, you see in verse 8, from the commander of the officials that he might not define himself. And finally, by the mercy of God, permission was granted, and he and his three friends, the four young uh, Hebrews from Judea, were given the opportunity to demonstrate that their God could take care of these young men better than any other gods could take care of their young men in the court of Babylon. What a marvelous testimony. Yes. And all through the book of Daniel, he shows tremendous respect for the king under whom he served. As we'll see in chapter 4, where he tells Nebuchadnezzar, I am just devastated by the awful things God showed to you in this dream. Judgment is coming, sir. And I am so sad because I respect you. Isn't that amazing, friends? And I say, Lord, help me to be very careful how I speak about those in authority above me because Romans 13 says that God has placed them there. Not, that, not mindless submission, but respect for those in high positions. Yes, in chapter 6 under Darius the Mede, he worked diligently as a government official. He showed tremendous conscientiousness toward Darius the Mede, by which means, by the way, he gained not only his respect, but in my opinion, he won him to the Lord. When Daniel was dropped in the lion's den, the king said, Oh, Daniel, your God, whom you so continually, faithfully serve, will rescue you. My, 
What a testimony Daniel must have had before that monarch to gain that kind of confidence, not only in Daniel, but in Daniel's God, you see. Even in chapter 8, when he's under the rulership of a miserable ruler, uh, an utterly debauched, corrupt man named Belshazzar, he was diligent to do the king's business. That is something of profound significance in Holy Scripture. But nevertheless, friends, he did not put the government above his God. Now listen to this balance here that only the Holy Spirit can give us. Whenever the government commanded him to do something that was contrary to his convictions and to his spiritual priorities, he uh, respectfully refused the commandment of the government and trusted God for the outcome. Now remember what the three friends of Daniel faced when they were commanded to bow down before the great image that Nebuchadnezzar set up in the plain of Dura and worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar. They absolutely refused. This is one of the most spectacular passages in all the Bible. Turn to Daniel 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this. In other words, we, there's no point of having a lengthy discussion or apology or explanation. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king one way or the other, by death or by deliverance. But even if he does not, even if he does not plan to deliver us from death, watch this. Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, they had no guarantee, friends, that they would survive this ordeal. I mean, it wasn't a pleasant thought to be dropped into a burning, fiery furnace. And later on, at the end of Daniel's career, when he was dropped into the lion's den, it wasn't a pleasant experience to anticipate. He had no guarantee that he would survive either. And I'm sure that he could say to King Darius, Sir, uh, I will not use your name in my worship of the living God as my intercessor, my mediator. Now, Darius had been tricked, you remember, into signing a decree that nobody could offer a prayer to God without mentioning his name by way of being the mediator. In the name of Darius the Mede, Lord, I come to you. What blasphemy. He refused to do that. With all due respect to Darius the Mede, who could not change the law even though he tried to when he found he was tricked, Daniel willingly entered the place of certain death, from which God marvelously delivered him as we know. That will never be forgotten in the history of the world. Quoted even in Hebrews 11. Well, friends, I'm sure that what Daniel and his three friends demonstrated here was never forgotten by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter and the apostles said when they were commanded never again to preach in the name of Jesus or preach his resurrection from the dead, They said, we must obey God rather than men. Now, of course, we have to be careful here, don't we, friends, to maintain a biblical balance in our relationship to the government. Many things that we realize are contrary to God's word. Uh, We're not to become insurrectionists, but just with determination and with humility and with faithfulness, obey what God has told us to do no matter what the uh, public school teacher tells you about how the world began or what politicians may tell you about our national priorities or a thousand other things that tempt us to move away from, to compromise what God has revealed. May we do that with patience, humility, and determination to honor God in a godless world. Another great attribute of Daniel was his humility. 
if anyone had a claim to fame, it was Daniel. I mean, he was the wisest man in the entire world, and even Ezekiel, his contemporary prophet, uh, developed a, a motto. Oh, you're wiser than Daniel. In other words, nobody could be wiser than Daniel. He was the top of all the wise men in the court of Babylon. After three years of training, he got all the answers correct. He and his three friends and was position number one in the nation. But look what he says when uh, he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Chapter 2 of Daniel, verse 30. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. That's exactly the answer that Joseph gave to Pharaoh in Genesis 41. Guess who was the most humble person who ever walked the earth? The Lord Jesus himself. Did he, have a, did he have a right to be proud? Yes. Arrogant? Yes. Self-sufficient? Yes. But he totally depended on his Father. Gave us a model, an example, you see, of Gen Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily, that I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Think of that. Who said that? The Son of God. Which provokes a question, doesn't it, friends? Who do we think we are to boast of anything when everything we have that's worth having, everything we know that's worth knowing, came from the Lord? See, humility is a very major attribute or virtue in the Bible for human beings. Okay? And I say, well, Lord, I can't imagine anybody as famous, as brilliant, as powerful as Daniel constantly in his great prayer in Daniel 9 saying, I have sinned, I have failed, I'm part of an evil nation. When he had every right to say, well, it's not my fault, I don't relate myself to those people over there. No, he identified himself with the sins of his nation. And that's why, as you read through the book of Daniel, you see that he gained tremendous respect because of his character, his faithfulness, his humility, as he served for more than 80 years in Babylon. Under one, I mean, he outlived all the kings. Nebuchadnezzar reigned 43 years, he outlived him. His son Amel Marduk, he outlived him. The Barshi Marduk outlived him. Anerglissar outlived him. And Nabonidus outlived him. And Belshazzar outlived him. And he's living all the way down into the Medo-Persian Empire. And you say, well, this man is... I mean, he's above defeat. I mean, everybody else is gone. Daniel's still there. How, how God honored this man with fantastic strength and wisdom and longevity. Reminds one of Moses, doesn't it? Who at the age of 120, of whom it could be said, his eye was not dim nor his strength abated. And I think, Lord, help us. Help us. Please. Okay? He had great respect. Now look please at Daniel 4 with me, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar was given a dream from God that pronounced his coming judgment for his pride and arrogance. And suspecting it was bad news, he refused to ask Daniel what the dream meant. And finally, when all the so-called wise men failed him, Verse 8, finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom is a spirit of the holy God. And I related the dream to him, saying, O oh, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy God is in you, and no mystery baffles you, tell me the vision that I have seen. Turn to chapter 5. Nebuchadnezzar is dead. And now Belshazzar is on the throne. He is now <clears throat> performing public blasphemy by using the sacred utensils of the temple of the living God in Jerusalem to uh, decorate the banquet hall with this 
a horrible performance of depravity. All of a sudden, watch who, who enters into the banquet hall. Verse 10, the queen, the queen, what queen? I believe it's Nebuchadnezzar's widow, Amethyst, for whom he built this lean, the, the, uh, the great tower uh, with the hanging garden. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles, and she said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, actually maternal grandfather, your father, the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners, and this is because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Well, friends, isn't it remarkable that even though the death of Nebuchadnezzar, in a sense, put him on the shelf for many years, in the shadows. There were people, including the Queen Dowager, who never forgot the incredible, incomparable reputation of this man of God. Well, of course, even in the realm of Darius the Mede, you see in chapter 6, verse 2, that over the three leaders, God, under, under God, Daniel was placed as number one Number one, why? Look at verse three. Are you with me? Daniel 6, 3. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. But the main thing about Daniel, friends, and that's where we all come together this morning because we will very, very unlikely become top officials of the United States of America. But in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he's going to soon establish on the earth, and of which we are spiritual members through the new birth by faith in his finished work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, we will have marvelous privileges under Christ to rule and to reign as kings and priests for those coming thousand years. What about our access to these precious, precious truths that will transform our life and our thinking and our testimony as long as we live? Number one, a hunger and thirst bordering on desperation for everything God has chosen to tell us of what the future holds. You know how desperate Daniel was for revealed prophetic insights and truth? When God told him things that he couldn't quite understand, he demanded more explanations. He wanted more answers. I'm sure the interpreting angels were becoming very, very discouraged at the constant questions he asked. I want to know more. I want to know more. I want the exact interpretation of this statement you've given. I want, no, I want more insights on how the world will end. The destiny of my people, Israel. See, whether he would live to see it wasn't the point. He wanted to know what was the destiny of Israel under God's eternal plan. In fact, when he couldn't quite understand what God told him, he collapsed physically in agony. How many of us are that desperate for prophetic truth, for biblical insights? for an understanding of God's plan for the ages. I ask that myself, of myself. And God gave him incomparable discernment because of this. Would you look with me now at Daniel 9, verse 23. After this tremendous prayer for his nation, knowing the 70 years captivity was coming to an end, he's pleading with God, to rescue Jerusalem, to rescue that holy city, the temple, this people Israel, bring them back, reestablish them, restore them. Watch what happens. 
verse 20. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, one of the only two angels of the righteous angelic world that's named in the Bible, whom I had seen in the vision previously in chapter 8, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering and gave me instruction and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued and I have come to tell you, now watch this, for you are highly esteemed. You're known in the third heaven, sir. We angels are amazed at you. You love God. You are hungry and thirsty for his will and word, and we're coming to tell you the answers you've been seeking. Do you ever have a sense when you pray to the third heaven, to the living God, that something of cosmic significance is now happening on your behalf? The Spirit of God interceding with groanings which cannot be uttered, the Lord Jesus interceding for us night and day, Revelation chapter 12. Do you have a feeling that God is taking your prayer seriously if it's offered in the name of Jesus, his beloved Son? How seriously do we take this matter of prayer? Well, God does. All the righteous angels do. And he said, Daniel, you are a man greatly esteemed. So here's what's going to happen to you now. Now tune in, please, because many people are suspicious of, confused about, or even in a state of rebellion against detailed biblical prophecy because it's been so widely mishandled, you see. But watch this. I have come to give, to give you understanding of the vision, you see. Look back at the end of verse 22. I'm going to give you insight with understanding. We're not going to talk about opinions and theories and conjectures. We're going to have truth and understanding and mastery of prophetic truth. So what's going to happen here? He's going to start unfolding step by step the chronological outworking of prophetic program of God for the nation of Israel. Back in chapter 7, you know what God told him about the future of Israel? that there's going to come a time of great tribulation for your people, which will last how long? Three and one half years. Time, times, and half a time. In chapter 8, there's a foretaste of what's coming through Antiochus Epiphanes, 165 B.C., who was the Antichrist in advance, who desecrated the temple, destroyed the Holy Scriptures, tried to wipe out the religion of Israel totally. And you know how long that lasted? 2,300 evenings and mornings. God knows precisely how long the afflictions of his people will continue. But then, friends, when you come to uh, chapter 9 here, God is going to tell us there's going to be a seven-year period at the end of this age before the kingdom comes in the midst of which the Antichrist, the prince that's coming, will break his seven-year covenant with Israel and cause the sacrifice and the oblation in the temple to cease. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to set himself up to be worshipped by the whole human race. That's explained, of course, in Revelation 13 and 17 and even Revelation 11 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and other passages in the Lord Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place as recorded by Daniel the prophet, whoso reads, let him what? Understand. Jesus said, you master the book of Daniel because when these things begin to happen, you won't be caught off guard. You will be tuned in to prophetic truth. God puts a tremendous premium on the unfolding program he has for his church and later for Israel on this earth. Yes, there's going to be a seven-year period in the midst of which the Antichrist will break the covenant he made at the beginning of the 70th, 70th week 
for a unit of seven years. Sixty-nine years are gone. They all ended before Jesus was crucified. The seventieth and last week, that is a week of seven years, is yet to come and could begin today. With the church is gone, two witnesses appear in Jerusalem, God begins his program for Israel. And you know how the book ends? Turn with me now in conclusion to Je Daniel chapter 12. It's sort of sad, really. Sort of sad. He's going to say, farewell, Daniel. Enough questions for now. No more answers. Except just a couple more little details, sir. Are you ready? Verse 11. And from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, that's in the middle of the 70th week, there will be 1,290 days, watch the extra 30 that's added, see, which is the exact amount of time it took Hezekiah to cleanse the temple from the abominations that his wicked father Ahaz had perpetrated. How blessed, verse 12, is he who keeps waiting, here's the last prophecy now, who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. That's it, Daniel. That's all. 75 days after the second coming. In, there'll be a process accomplished for the purifying, cleansing, and purging of all evil from this world before the inaugural banquet that the Lord Jesus will establish to inaugurate his kingdom. Daniel, that's all you need to know. And I say, well, thank you, Lord. You gave us what we need to know. But there's progressive revelation all through the Bible. More and more is added, more details. And Daniel didn't know something John was told, that that kingdom would last 1,000 years. 1,000 years. You know what, friends, it's amazing. In Genesis 1 and in Revelation 20, a year means a year. A month means a month. A day means a day. Because chronology is the backbone of history, which is the foundation and the whole superstructure around theology. And God says, take me, trust me seriously. These are real events involving real people in a real world directed and controlled by a real living God. And I say thank you, Lord, for this precious book. Help me, like Daniel, to be restless, desperate even, for your explanations of your revelation that I might be somehow a, a light reflector, like Daniel was, in a deepening, darkening world, for the glory of Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Let's pray.